Thanks for being here, everyone. I'm sorry I'm late. I actually, on my way here, I dumped uh, most of a cup of water on the floor outside the Oval Office. Very embarrassing. <laughs> Pete Souza, the White House photographer, insisted that it was a cup of coffee and he was going to make a picture of the day out of it. But it was, it was in fact, whoa, water. I have no announcements. Um, I wanted to take the toughest questions first, but I don't see Connie here. So, <laughs> which is it? She got me yesterday. Uh, but so we'll go straight to the Associated Press. Thank you. Um, on the Israel bill signing today, I know you got a similar question on the Olympics readout yesterday. But how much of the timing of this bill signing today and the announcement of the seventy million dollars in addition to that are tied to Romney's uh, upcoming visit to Israel? Well, Julie, as I think you know, the bill the president signed today. Uh, that reaffirms the United States' uh, unshakable commitment to Israel's security uh, was passed by Congress uh, this month and was sent to the President a week ago. The President's been traveling, so as is uh, normally the case, he signs uh, a bill when he gets it from Congress, a bill that he supports, and that's what he did. So the timing of uh, the passage and signing of this legislation was not up to us, uh, but up to Congress. And then on the uh, announcement that uh, funds have been transferred to fund uh, our support for uh, Iron Dome, the rocket defense program, uh, the uh, President directed those funds uh, to be made available in May and the, and the, the transfer was made uh, in recent days. And since uh, this is a program that's very directly related to the U.S.-Israeli security relationship, it's entirely appropriate to make that announcement uh, at the same time that he's signing this bill that was passed uh, in a bipartisan way in Congress. So, uh, you know, I, I think that it, it both uh, both the bill and the, the funds uh, announcement reflect the commitment of this administration to Israel's security, a commitment that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defense Minister Barak uh, have both said uh, demonstrates, uh, has reached a level that's unprecedented uh, under this administration. I remember standing with uh, Vice President Biden when we were in Jerusalem uh, uh, with uh, Pre uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu when he said that uh, to the, uh, both the traveling and is the, the Israeli press, that this administration's commitment to Israel's mm -hmm. security uh, is unprecedented. And, it, and the, le the amount of cooperation that uh, we have with Israel uh, on its security needs is unprecedented. Do you feel like it's helpful to be able to uh, underscore that commitment just a day before Romney heads to Israel? Well, again, I think that the fact that Congress passed this legislation, bipartisan piece of legislation, uh, and that it arrived at the White House in recent right. days, uh, made signing of it this week uh, necessary. And, you know, I, I, I understand the coincidence. But the fact is our cooperation with Israel on its security is a subject we could discuss every day because there are things that take place in that relationship uh, and in uh, our assistance to Israel every day. So uh, the fact of the matter is we combined the two today. We could have spread it out over a couple of days, but um, figured that the Iron Dome transfer was uh, so related to the uh, legislation that uh, we could uh, knock them both out in one day. On Syria, you know, as we've talked about the differences between Libya and Syria, one of the reasons that the administration gives for why the U.S. and international partners went into Libya was that there was an imminent attack on a city. And we're seeing exactly that situation in Aleppo today. Does that in any way change uh, the discussion between the U.S. and international partners about what types of uh, involvement you'll have in Syria? Well, we are very concerned about the situation in Aleppo. as I talked about in the last several days the um, assault that Assad's forces have been uh, per perpetrating on the civilian population center is uh, heinous, reprehensible. Uh, the kinds of weaponry that they're using uh, against unarmed civilians uh, I think demonstrates the depths of depravity to which Assad uh, has sunk. The uh, fact of the matter is while your analogy is, is uh, it's a good question, and I understand the analogy. Uh, there were a broader array of issues that uh, allowed for the, 
the kind of action that the United States, led, you know, the international community led by the United States uh, was able to take in Libya. Uh, there was the imminent assault. Uh, there was the uh, call from the opposition, the unified opposition for international action. Uh, there was international consensus, both uh, at the level of the uh, United Nations Security Council as well as regional uh, consensus through the Arab League. We do not have that, and we've been very blunt about our disappointment uh, with uh, the Russians and the Chinese and the fact that they have vetoed the three meaningful resolutions that were put before the United Nations Security Council uh, with regards to Syria and Assad. That's why we're working uh, beyond the Security Council now with uh, the Friends of Syria, other international partners, to try to build consensus to uh, further isolate and pressure Assad. Uh, it's why we're continuing to provide humanitarian assistance to the Syrian people, why we're continuing to provi provide non-lethal assistance to the opposition, why, we'll, why we are working with our partners, uh, with the opposition to help the opposition unify and uh, fulfill the, uh, or take steps to fulfill the uh, plan that they put forward uh, not long ago. And uh, it's why we will continue to call on the international community to all members of the international community and, and, and all nations with a stake in the future of the region and of Syria uh, to recognize that siding with Assad is, is allying yourself with a tyrant, is uh, ensuring that the Syrian people will uh, remember uh, your assistance to Assad uh, long beyond Assad's removal from power or disappearance from the scene, uh, and we continue to make that case. Reuters. Um, just to ask Syria you, you for one moment, the sure. UN Secretary General said today that um, Syria should categorically state that it will not use chemical weapons um, under any circumstances. So we, we've talked about this before, but I wondered if you think a statement like that is needed, if that's enough when it comes to chemical weapons. Well, it's, it's certainly not enough. Uh, as we've said all along, we judge, we've long since given up uh, or long since uh, uh, understood that Assad's word is not worth very much, uh, that he uh, routinely fails to keep his promises, live up to his commitments, and that's most evident recently by his the lip service he paid to the Anon plan uh, and his uh, categorical refusal to uh, abide by it, any of the six points of the Anon plan. The, on the issue of chemical weapons, there's no question that we share the point of view that uh, they should never be used, uh, that the Syrian government not only must not use those weapons but must maintain control of them, uh, and uh, any failure to do that uh, will be, uh, will result in those responsible being held accountable by the international community. Uh, so our, our, our views on this, I think, as, as I've expressed recently, are, uh, are very strong. We are concerned about the disposition of the weapons. We believe that the stockpiles remain under uh, Syrian government control, and we, uh, as I just said, uh, reiterate our position that uh, any use of those weapons, any uh, failure to safeguard those uh, stockpiles would be uh, a very uh, serious transgress transgression that would be uh, result in those responsible being held accountable. Okay, GDP. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons that the rate of growth was um, as low as it was today, um, while still growing, not, not growing very quickly, is that consumer confidence seems to be lower, um, autom automobile sales was one of the things that was slow. Um, I wonder if you had a, a message to American consumers who were wondering um, whether to make a big purchase or not, um, given the uncertainty that is um, around related to where the economy is. Well, I would say that on the issue of GDP, what we have seen is uh, the 12th straight quarter of economic growth, positive growth, 
and that is a good thing. We have also seen um, over the last three years an economy that has expanded by 6.7 percent overall and the private components of the GDP uh, have grown by nearly 10 percent, 9.9 percent. And yet, uh, as we say consistently, this is not enough. And this is, this is growth that is not fast enough. This is job creation that is not substantial enough. Uh, and that's why Congress needs to act. That's why uh, you know, the President continues to insist that the proposals he's put forward that outside economists say would have an immediate impact on economic growth and, and an immediate impact on job creation must be passed by Congress and we'll continue to make that case. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, I, we obviously, despite the sustained growth, despite the private sector job creation, uh, are still in a position where we're uh, pulling ourselves out of the very deep hole caused by the Great Recession. And uh, there is still, of course, a great deal of anxiety in the country about the economy. And that's why we need to take these steps. That's why it is simply unacceptable to say, you know, We'll wait until next year, perhaps, to do to take action on uh, economic growth and job creation. We should do it right now because these are the things that are in the jobs, Act, the American Jobs Act, the president's proposal that Congress has not yet passed would create, according to outside economists, a million jobs: firefighters, teachers, construction workers, uh, and every one of those jobs carries with it not just the benefit for those individuals who are employed and their families, uh, but outsized positive benefits to the economy and to society through uh, the, the building of roads and bridges and high uh, ports and, and schools and through the placement of more teachers in classrooms uh, that has obvious positive effects on education in this country. And this president believes very strongly that education is a key element of our economic picture. So, uh, you know, we're going to keep pressing for action. Uh, the President is going to continue to do everything he can administratively to help the economy grow and create jobs, and he's going to continue to hammer the point uh, that we know what we can do right now to spur growth and job creation, and Congress needs to act. Uh, Jake. Um, Jay, eight years ago, I think you were there, I was in the, the Democratic National Convention in Boston, Massachusetts, and I heard a fairly obscure state senator stand up and give a speech in which he talked about how right then there were spinmeisters and negative ad peddlers preparing to divide the country. Mm -hmm. Given that the vast, vast majority of the ads that are running these days from both sides, both uh, Governor Romney and President Obama, are negative. I think in one New York Times story it said all of the ones that ran in Richmond over a certain period were, were negative, not one positive ad. And then there was a study that showed in a two-week period 89% of the President's ads were negative. 94% of Mitt Romney's ads were negative. What would that state senator think about the campaign uh, being run right now by this president? Well, I think that uh, he thinks and we think that uh, the issues that the president talks about all the time uh, as president and as a candidate go right to uh, the central concern that the American people have about economic growth and job creation, about uh, ensuring that the middle class is given a, a shot to expand, that uh, the squeeze that the middle class has been under now for, uh, for a decade uh, is relieved, and uh, that there's uh, the right investments made in our economy, in education and infrastructure and innovation uh, that will allow it to grow and will allow it to create uh, the kinds of jobs here in the United States uh, that uh, can uh, create the foundation for a good middle class life. It allows that's why people. You're running ads about your tax returns. Well, that, that's why we're running ads about. Well, first of all, I'm not. You know, I'm not speaking for the campaign. That's why the pro president believes that the issue of what do you believe when it comes to uh, what our tax code should look like and and whether uh, we should reward companies that ship jobs overseas or should we reward companies that insource jobs in the United States. That's a policy difference that is extremely important. Uh, this president believes that as a matter of economic policy, uh, it is a, an important point of discussion uh, to note the difference between his position, which is that we ought to uh, 
have a balanced approach where uh, the wealthiest Americans who have done extremely well, exceptionally well, uh, in the last uh, decade uh, pay their fair share, and that, and that the high-end Bush tax cuts that contributed mightily to the deficits that he inherited uh, not be extended, and that that money be used to help bring down the debt and to invest uh, where it, we need investments in education, innovation, and infrastructure. Um, and that, that's a fundamental difference, not, not, not just with the Republican nominee or presumptive nominee, but with uh, Republicans in Congress that this president has been uh, uh, dealing with in, in an attempt to move the economy forward uh, legislatively. So, I mean, I think those are the, all those issues are fundamental to the debate we're having right now. They're fundamental to the stalemate we have in Washington that the president discusses. Uh, and that's why I think he phrases it uh, the, the way he does, that the American people have the opportunity to break that stalemate, to, to decide which direction, which vision uh, is the right one for the, uh, for the American economy. So I think those are the those issues are the subject of uh, most of what the president talks about and, and what his campaign uh, discusses. Uh, you know, I, I obviously refer you to uh, the Romney campaign for their points of view so on their advertising. The characterization that these ads are negative? I, no, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think that when we, the president draws distinctions about his vision for the economy uh, compared to the Republican vision, uh, you know, it is a contrast, there's no question. But, uh, but you know, these are central. There, are, these are central to. I mean, this is the this is the absolute core of the debate in our country. It is it is overwhelmingly the principal focus of the American people. Uh, so I think it's very important to have uh, the kinds of uh, discussions that we've been having and that the president puts forward every time he goes out and speaks to the people. Phil. Can it really be a coincidence that just as Mitt Romney embarks on his foreign trip? Then in the past few days, the president not only has a chance to declare his unshakable support for Israel and sign this bill, but uh, his Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor meets with people to discuss security preparations for the Olympics, and the Secretary of Defense meets with the Israeli Secretary of Defense and announces a trip to Poland. Can all that really be a coincidence? Uh, Bill, let me, let me ask you. I, I, I wish it were the case that we could direct Congress and have it do what we wanted on our schedule all the time. Uh, the bill the President signed today was passed by Congress, bipartisan majorities, and sent to the White House, uh, I believe, le a week ago. And the President's been on the road, and today was the day to sign it. What about the President of we, I, I will, if you would like, come out here every time we have a senior administration official meeting with a senior Israeli government official, and it will happen, I'm sure, uh, extremely frequently, because uh, that's how uh, intense the cooperation is between uh, the United States and, and Israel on security matters, as well as other issues. Uh, so, and then on the, on the Olympics, whatever country the Olympics were in, this president would have been briefed on security. This is a major event, international event, uh, with thousands of Americans present, uh, hundreds of American athletes present, uh, and it's the kind of thing that he would, as a matter of routine uh, preparation, be briefed on, uh, just as he is the Super Bowl and other issues and other major events uh, uh, where there is an American security interest. And this one happens to be, this, the, this event happens to be t taking place in the United Kingdom, uh, a country with which we have uh, deep, uh, uh, relation, a deep relationship and a deep security cooperative relationship. So, uh, you know, uh, it is a matter of course that he would, the pres that, that John Brennan would be involved in that and that the president would be briefed on that. And I routinely read out those briefings uh, from the podium. So there's no political calculation whatsoever involved here? No. Well, on, the, on the issues that you just talked, I think I uh, raised, I, I think I just explained to you uh, that the president signed a bill that was passed by Congress, Republicans and Democrats. Um, and uh, the Olympics is an event that uh, this president would be briefed on in terms of security uh, as a matter of course, no matter where they were uh, or what time of year uh, they took place. Jay, on Israel, um, at the beginning you made a joke, obviously, about not answering the question yesterday. Um, in the transcript from yesterday's briefing, you added at the top the administration position, obviously. Um, 
could you explain why you didn't answer the question and why you decided to add that, I guess? Well, I wanted to be clear. I, I, I added it because, look, I did uh, assume that uh, everyone here knew our position, since it is the same position that we have held uh, since the President was sworn into office. Not only that, uh, and this goes to some of the uh, uh, criticism, uh, and perhaps the critics don't realize this, it's the same position that was held by the previous administration for eight years. Uh, our policy has not changed. The status of Jerusalem is an issue that should be resolved in final status negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians. And we continue to work with uh, both parties to resolve this issue and others in a way that is just and fair and respects the rights and aspirations of both Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, so I, I, I did assume that uh, uh, since this is a policy that's been longstanding and in place for uh, many, many years now across uh, administrations of both parties that um, uh, that it was understood, but I, I, I accept that uh, uh, it merited clarification. So thus we provided it. Great. On the economy, um, you said headed in the right direction, but obviously more uh, needs to be done. At a fundraiser on Wednesday night, the President was talking about in the, I think in Oakland, in the context of what the Clinton administration did, and you said this as well yesterday here in the briefing room, um, about sort of the balanced approach, as you call it. Um, he said, quote, we tried our plan and it worked. But he was not just talking about his plan, he was talking about the Clinton proposal. He was talking about the Clinton proposal, and I understand that it's part of the course, maybe this goes to Jake's question, of um, an effort to serially distort uh, what the President said. I mean, anybody who listens uh, listened to that set of remarks and has heard the President uh, President Obama discuss uh, President Clinton's record uh, surely understands he was citing the approach that was taken by President Clinton, uh, an approach that, I, as I noted, noted yesterday, for those of us who covered it, in 1993, uh, when uh, the President uh, Clinton's economic plan was passed and it included uh, uh, increases in revenue, uh, that uh, Republicans, including some of the very leaders in, uh, in Congress today, uh, declared from the floor of the House and the Senate uh, that it would lead to recession, uh, economic decline, stagnation, unemployment, uh, and uh, they were wrong, entirely and completely. And it led instead to the longest peacetime expansion in our history, and it led to the creation of 24 million jobs. A pretty good record. So that's what the President, President Obama was talking about. Right. And so that's the context. My question is, is he running on the Clinton economy or the Obama economy? He, he is running on uh, his record. He is running on a vision for the future uh, and an economic plan that uh, as a one component, that has as one component uh, a fundamental principle that uh, everyone ought to uh, play by the same set of rules and everybody ought to uh, get a fair shot and everyone ought to uh, pay their fair share. And part of the paying their fair share is uh, simply suggesting that the highest income Americans, those making over $250,000, the top 2%, including millionaires and billionaires, uh, can afford to and should uh, pay income taxes at the marginal rate that was in place in the 1990s uh, when we had uh, one of the strongest economies uh, in American history and when we created 24 million jobs. Uh, uh, an economic record uh, that uh, occurred despite all the predictions of Republican leaders. But it's not that with unemployment over 8 percent, GDP slowing down now, the worst in a year, you'd rather talk about those years than... We're not talking... We're, we're talking about... He's talking about an economic policy. His plan, which he talks about all the time, which involves uh, a balanced approach, including uh, ex expiration of the high-end Bush tax cuts, uh, and as a rebuttal to uh, the assertions from Republicans that uh, this is terrible economic policy. He points to uh, the facts, which is that, uh, which are that under President Clinton, marginal rates at that level um, were in place when we saw this uh, uh, substantial economic growth and job creation. Uh, but let's be clear. Uh, I, I saw it recently. Um, uh, it's suggested by uh, a leading Republican that. Uh, the next president, whether it's President Obama in his second term or uh, his opponent in his first, uh, that his policies, uh, economic policies, should be uh, judged after six or nine months after they come into office. And then a after that period, then uh, you know, it's a fair grace period to uh, after which you can judge whether or not those policies are having an impact. Um, I find that uh, fascinating. 
uh, given some of the discourse uh, that we've engaged in uh, over uh, recent months. Uh, but if you do take that standard and apply it to President Obama, who took office during the worst uh, cataclysmic economic recession in full bloom uh, of our lifetimes uh, and uh, began to measure the economy's performance after his first six months in office, we'll just start at six months, not even nine months, and you'll uh, see a, a record of uh, economic growth and job creation uh, as we emerge from the worst recession since the Great Depression, um, and positive job creation, net job creation. Uh, it is not enough. Uh, as we saw today with the GDP numbers, the economy is not growing fast enough. Uh, the economy is not creating jobs fast enough. And this, pro this president says that every time he speaks about the economy, and that's why he calls on Congress uh, to do the right thing, to pass, for the House to pass the measure that cleared the Senate this week, uh, that would extend tax cuts to 98 uh, percent of the American people and to 97 percent of small businesses in America, uh, and to pass the measures of the American Jobs Act that would create or save uh, over a million jobs, that would put teachers back in the classroom, uh, first responders back on the job, and construction workers back to work. Yes. On Syria, uh, Reuters is reporting that the White House has crafted a, quote, presidential directive that would authorize greater covert assistance for the rebels. Can you confirm that? Uh, I can't comment on that Reuters report, no. Did you confirm that the president is more actively considering enhanced assistance to the rebels? How much farther has he gone? Yeah, I can only say what our policy is, uh, which is to continue to provide humanitarian assistance to the Syrians. Uh, to continue to pump, provide non-lethal assistance to the opposition, to continue to work with uh, the Friends of Syria and others, uh, other uh, uh, nations that uh, have a stake in and care about the Syrian people and the region, uh, to isolate uh, the Syrian uh, regime, uh, to put pressure on it, to starve Assad of the financial resources that he needs to continue to uh, wage war on his, own, on his people. Uh, that is our policy. You said that Assad's fall is imminent, given what we're seeing in Aleppo, given this... I think it's inevitable. Fight. I don't know about imminent, but his days are numbered. Do you still stand by that? Certainly. Look, the, the, there, there, are, there are daily reminders of the fact that his grip on power is uh, loosening, uh, that his control over the country is uh, diminishing. Uh, we've seen uh, almost daily defections of high-level government officials, military officials. We've seen um, other indications uh, through the, uh, in, uh, by the consolidation of and the, uh, the strength of the opposition that, that Assad is, is uh, losing control. Uh, but I'm not going to get into the business of predicting uh, when Assad will leave power. I will simply say that uh, he must and he will, uh, and uh, because the Syrian people demand it. Senator Schumer and six other Democratic senators have offered an amendment to the cybersecurity bill that would limit the purchase of high-capacity gun magazines for some consumers. Would the president support such an amendment? No, I haven't seen I haven't seen that legislation or had that discussion with him. I think, as we discussed uh, at length yesterday, uh, uh, the president, you know, believes that we need to um, uh, focus on common sense measures that protect Second Amendment rights, but. <clears throat> uh, ensure that those uh, who uh, should not have guns under existing law cannot get them. Uh, we need to uh, take a step back and have a broader discussion about uh, the problem of violence and, a, and attack that problem uh, from a variety of angles, including uh, through assistance that this administration provides to local law enforcement and local governments, uh, through programs that put teenagers to work and get them off, gets the, uh, programs that get them off the street, uh, and, and, and programs that uh, uh, help educate our, our, our young people uh, and keep them away from gangs and away from violence. So it, this is a broader problem as the President sees it, uh, but on that specific proposal I, I don't have a response because I haven't seen it and haven't uh, discussed it with him. Mark. Jay, if the GDP says or shows that the economy is not growing fast enough, as you say, why isn't that an indication that it's the wrong time to raise anybody's taxes? The President believes that 98% uh, of the American people should have the certainty that Congress can provide right now uh, 
that their taxes will not go up, that that tax cut to the middle class will be extended. Uh, and I, I, I'm sure you have done that. If, if, you, if you ask economists in terms of the macroeconomic effect of ta uh, tax cuts and, this, and the uh, growth effect of tax cuts, uh, they will tell you that tax cuts to that 98 percent will have a vastly disproportionate benefit to the economy uh, than will uh, very expensive tax cuts to the top 2 percent uh, because Millionaires and billionaires, for example, are not, yet, you know, the, the, those tax cuts would be substantial if ex extended and very expensive. The, the dollar for dollar benefit of those tax cuts to the economy is much less than the benefit of tax cuts that go to working Americans, middle class Americans, uh, who are struggling to make ends meet, who use that money uh, to pay bills, uh, to fund education, uh, and uh, therefore put that money right back into the economy and where it has, there's a virtuous cycle, it helps. Uh, drive economic growth and drive job creation. So uh, this, is, uh, this is about choices. It's about uh, a, the, the fact that we need to get our fiscal house in order, uh, the fact that we need to ensure that the middle class uh, has economic certainty, uh, and we need to make the right investments to help our economy uh, grow into the future, and that means investments in education uh, and innovation and infrastructure. Uh, so the President's position, I think, uh, is very clear. It happens to be supported by uh, a majority of the American people, uh, and it reflects a very careful assessment by the President and his economic team of what the right policies are, the right mix of policies are, uh, to help the economy grow, uh, to help the middle class, uh, and to help deal with our fiscal challenges. And you would and, and President Obama would stand firm against uh, tax cuts for everybody if, um, if that was the only choice, right? The President has made clear that he will not sign a bill that extends tax cuts uh, for the top 2 percent of uh, American earners, uh, the wealthiest Americans. The top 2 percent, 98 percent, he agrees with, I believe, every Republican on Capitol Hill and every Democrat on Capitol Hill uh, unanimously or close to it uh, that 98 percent of the American people should have their tax cuts extended. The top 2 percent uh, of tax cuts that President Bush put into place in 2001 and 2003 uh, are simply more than we can afford uh, and, 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 and extending them, uh, by extending them it's we would be making a choice uh, to uh, place the burden of getting our fiscal house in order on the middle class, to place the burden of dealing with our fiscal challenges on seniors and on the disabled. Uh, uh, we would make the choice of uh, providing tax cuts to the wealthiest Americans as opposed to investments in education, investments in medical research. Uh, you know, we do not have infinite resources. And uh, one of the virtues of all the work that's been done on this issue over the past two years, including the Simpson-Bowles Commission and the Rivlin Domenici Commission, is the identification of the truth, which is that tax cuts represent spending. Tax cuts reduce revenues and reflect the same kinds of choices that you have to make when you allocate funds to defense spending or uh, in education spending or uh, entitlement spending. So. Uh, these, this is the kind of, this is the balanced approach that the President believes we need to take. And uh, when you say that it is more important to give tax cuts to the top 2 percent uh, than ensure uh, that Medicare, uh, as we know it, stays in place, no, when, when, a, when, a, when the argument is made, uh, you're, you're, you're making a choice there that uh, is harmful to the economy, is harmful to American seniors, uh, and is not supported by the majority of the American people. But you're saying it's more important to deny a tax cut extension to the top 2 percent than to give it to everybody. No, we're saying that since we all agree that the 98 percent should have their tax cut expend, uh, extended, then we should pass that tomorrow. Tomorrow. Now, the only issue, there is a bill to do that. The only issue is now, uh, will the House take that bill up and pass it or not? 
And if they do not, then they are making the choice that it, uh, tax cuts for 98% of the American people should be held hostage to tax cuts for the top 2%. Uh, we can have the debate. If, if, if there is such passion behind the notion that those tax cuts for the top 2%, 2% must be extended, that uh, Warren Buffett and uh, Bill Gates and Justin Bieber and Mitt Romney and Barack Obama should get a tax cut, and if they don't, 98% of Americans should have their taxes raised, we'll have that debate. Um, I'm just, based on what Mark said, I'm assuming he's in that top 2%, but uh, I can't verify that. Thank you. Following up on Kristen's question, you said that the goal right now is to have a conversation about gun violence. What is the president planning on doing to advance that conversation? I think you heard the president speak uh, before a large audience uh, two nights ago uh, in New Orleans. I think it was two nights ago uh, on this issue. And, and I, I don't have any scheduling announcements for you, but he's directed his Department of Justice uh, uh, to uh, continue to find ways to um, make improvements in our background check system and, and other common sense measures that we can take administratively to uh, ensure that existing laws are enforced and ensure that uh, those who should not obtain weapons under existing law, like criminals, uh, cannot get them. And, uh, and then more broadly, I think if you listen to what the President said in New Orleans uh, and what he said in the hospital in Aurora, you know, there is a broader issue here about violence that uh, it goes well beyond uh, the question of legislation regarding weapons. But going beyond the legislation, what he said in the speech was that he would, quote, continue to talk to members mm -hmm. of both parties, civic organizations, and others who are interested in this issue. And I'm asking if he has any specific plans to well, do Well, I have that. no uh, scheduling announcements to make to you, but I think... But can you the, tell me whether he's planning to do it or not? Well, I, I would point <coughs> to what the President of the United States himself said. So he is planning to. Well, so if he, he doesn't, said, then... So I, well, look, the, the President will, has in the past, and will continue to address the broader issue of violence. Uh, he will continue to direct his administration uh, to take steps to assist local law enforcement, local government, in their efforts to combat violence. Uh, and we'll continue to, ins to insist uh, that we need to take broader measures uh, that assist young people, uh, that ensure that young people get an education and stay in school, uh, that also contribute, uh, can contribute positively to reducing violence. Uh, so I'm sure he will continue discussing these issues, and I'm, I, I point you to what he himself has said. Sure. But I, I'm not going to give you a, a date, uh, at, just like I don't give you a date when he's not gonna, next going to give a speech on uh, foreign policy or economic policy, I, or uh, I'm not going to give you a date on which he is going to make uh, a speech about these issues. From what I can tell, in between at the op-ed he wrote after in the wake of Tucson and the shootings in Aurora, he did not publicly address this issue at all. Well, I'm, not sure, so that's, when, I'm not sure well, that's the case. A, I think he, he did in getting asked about it and, and in other forums to discuss it. Secondly, on the broader issue of violence, secondly, in that period, uh, at his direction, the Department of Justice uh, made progress on the very uh, issues that he asked them to make progress on, as we put put out in, on paper, and I've discussed here and, and on Air Force One. But that doesn't speak to creating a national dialogue on the issue or trying to um, find consensus on what he calls, you know, issues that should have common ground, common sense um, efforts to try to control gun violence. And so but, I'm wondering. Again, Laura, I'm not sure your point. He just gave a major speech in which he talked about these issues. He uh, spoke about these issues in the hospital in Aurora. Uh, where he had just uh, visited the families of uh, uh, those who lost their lives uh, in that terrible uh, shooting, as well as uh, those uh, individuals who were recovering from wounds in that, shoot in that, in that shooting. And, uh, you know, he will, I'm sure, continue to talk about uh, the steps that we need to take uh, to address the problem of violence and to address the problem of violence that is with us uh, not just when we have these horrific events that garner headlines, but uh, with us consistently uh, around the country, and uh, as he mentioned in New Orleans. So having given the speech, he's done that. You know, Laura, you can continue to editorialize, but I've just, I've answered this question a bunch of times. I don't have an announcement for when the President's next going to address this issue. He told you that he would, and I would take his word on it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. So Russia is looking at setting up naval bases in, in Cuba and in Vietnam, and I'm wondering whether the president has been briefed about that and what he thinks about that. Do you have some concerns about it? Or is he cool with it? <laughs> 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 
yeah. I have not had that discussion with the president. Uh, it, it, not just uh, in the language that you use, but um, uh, but even uh, addressing Russia and Cuba. So I will have to take that question. Open another couple questions then. Um, uh, anything about the week ahead, including the weekend themes for next week, would be greatly appreciated. And can you give us um, kind of a good synopsis of his Olympic watching, calling, involvement plans in the days to come? Who's he going to be talking to, or are there any events he's totally keyed in on? Well, I, I can tell you just from from the travel we've done recently and talking to him about the Olympics in general. I mean, he is. I mean, he is a sports fan, as everyone knows. He is. He's actually very. He, 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 I heard him you know, the other day, he's like, I love the Olympics. I can't wait for the Olympics to start. So I, I don't know which events uh, he won't be paying attention to. His interests are very broad, and uh, uh, he's uh, read up a lot on our athletes and on the co upcoming competition and uh, looks forward to catching as much of the games as he can. Um, the, uh, the, you know, his schedule uh, being what it is. I, you know, I, I, there is a, at least one person in London I know he'll be in touch with uh, regularly. Uh, that, that would be the First Lady. Uh, uh, but I don't have any uh, announcements to make in terms of other, uh, any participation by the President. Uh, you know, I think, as you know, the First Lady is representing the United States uh, delegation uh, in London, uh, as has been the case in uh, years when a sitting President is running for re-election. Uh, he has not been able to, he, he regrettably is not able to make the trip himself. Uh, I, I can give you, what's that? Will he be watching one step riding? No, I think he, he is interested in seeing every American uh, entrant uh, perform well and he'll follow uh, every event. Uh, and I think uh, uh, if his schedule allows, I think the answer to that question is yes. On uh, the week ahead, I can give that to you now if you would like. Do I hear a chorus of yes? Yes. yes? yes. On Monday, the President will participate in an ambassador credentialing ceremony here at the White House. In the afternoon, the President will travel to New York City for campaign events. The President will return to Washington, D.C. that night. On Tuesday, the President will attend meetings here at the White House. On Wednesday, the President will travel to Mansfield, Ohio and Akron, Ohio for campaign events. Uh, the President will return to Washington, uh, D.C. that night. The next day, Thursday, the President will travel to Orlando, Florida and to Leesburg, Virginia for campaign events and will return uh, once again to Washington that evening. On Friday, the President will be here at the White House attending meetings. Yes, Mark. Okay. Right, sort of other schedule uh, Sunday and in between, he'll be watching the Olympics. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and in between the Olympic events on Sunday, Sunday is the 100th day from the election mark. Mm -hmm. I know the campaign was going to do some events like house parties and stuff. Is the President going to play any role in that? Is he going to mark that day in any fashion? I, I, I don't have any information involving the President's schedule on Sunday. Uh, I, I believe he's down, but I would address that question okay. to the campaign. On the larger question of, of the that, that mark, how does yeah, the President I, again, feel I, about the campaign at this point? Well, he's very, as you've seen, uh, as he's been out there, he's uh, energized. Uh, by the opportunity to get out and, and, and campaign to talk to uh, people across the country about his vision for uh, our economy uh, and uh, looks forward to the next hundred days or the next hundred and three or four or however many days there are. You know, I think, I don't think this is unique to him. I think it, it, it's true of uh, past presidents that, um, you know, the opportunity to get out uh, in the country and, and to uh, speak to folks in different states and to hear from them uh, is something that is very invigorating for him. I, you know, when, when we travel with him, uh, those of us who uh, have that opportunity and privilege, you know, you can just tell uh, how much he enjoys it and how much um, uh, energy he draws from it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously uh, campaigns can be, uh, uh, you know, grueling in terms of the hours and the schedule. Uh, he al also has a, a full-time job as president that uh, continues to um, uh, execute, uh, but he's very gratified at the opportunity and, and, and believes that the stakes could not be higher, uh, which is why he's uh, going out there and taking his case around the country.
All right. Thanks, Jay. I haven't Thanks, seen you in a while. How are you? It's nice to be back. Um, Long-term vacation or? No? I was with Rami, actually. Oh, well, that's kind of like a vacation. Uh, so we're, uh, uh, we're almost at the one-year anniversary of the credit rating downgrade. And I wonder how concerned the White House is that there could be another one while this president is in office, and given the paralysis in Congress, what the president can do to prevent that from happening. Uh, well, it's, uh, I had not been, uh, I had not thought about the fact that the uh, that, that that particular anniversary was uh, nearly upon us. I can say that it brings back um, grim memories of a willingness on Capitol Hill to uh, threaten the global economy and most importantly, the American economy, uh, for the sake of ideology. We now know that the price paid by that brinksmanship was great, uh, not just in the downgrade, uh, but in its impact on uh, consumer confidence, which was a question that we got earlier, its impact on economic growth and job creation. Um, that was a terrible game to play. Uh, and, and this president ensured, uh, as that process came to an end, that we would not be playing that game of chicken with the American economy uh, again in a periodic process of every three or six or nine months, which is what Republicans uh, were insisting on. Um, you know, we, the, the full faith and credit of the United States is a very valuable thing, and it should not be uh, toyed with. Uh, this president feels very strongly about that, and, and the memory of that, um, uh, I think, for all of us, uh, and the impact that it had on the economy uh, is, is, is not one that's particularly welcome. Uh, but it is a reminder of why Congress needs to act on responsible, balanced deficit reduction. Uh, that is why uh, the sequester uh, was put in place as a forcing mechanism to get Congress to act and make tough decisions uh, for both parties to accept that they would not get their maximalist positions and what you've seen is, unfortunately, uh, Republicans, uh, by and large, still refusing to accept the basic principle that everyone should pay their fair share, that, that we need all three legs of this stool. We need uh, significant spending cuts, which this president has already signed into law. We need entitlement reforms, which, is, which this president has made clear he is willing to uh, uh, support. And we need uh, revenues. And that is the only way to do this, to get the kinds of uh, the $4 trillion in, in, in deficit reduction that uh, is needed to address our fiscal challenges. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, we were all here. And it was um, uh, to see the willingness uh, the, 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 you know, that the, the, the some on Capitol Hill demonstrated uh, to take the economy over the cliff, uh, to risk default, uh, uh, was, uh, was very unfortunate. April. Politicians go overseas, and people say it's a dicey issue when they meet with foreign leaders. And then, particularly when, you know where I'm going, uh, presidential candidates uh, may go and meet with foreign leaders. What, how would you critique thus far the last couple of days for Mitt Romney uh, overseas? I would not. <laughs> Why not? You know, I'll, I'll take questions on policy, I'll, I'll certainly no, uh, entertain this, those. This relates to policy, though. The White House is working with London uh, on the Olympic issues. They, the White House works with uh, people from various parties in the UK uh, governmental system. They work with uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Cameron. Uh, talk to me about, so far, what, what you're feeling. I mean, because there are issues that could relate to come back here to the White House. Well, I Especially let, with Australia, what's happened with Australia? I will let others make those assessments. Um, many have been made, I've noticed. Uh, but, uh, you know, I will simply say that uh, while the focus of this election cycle is the economy, that's right, what the American people are focused on, that's certainly what the president is focused on, the presidency involves, uh, as a huge component of the job, engagement uh, in national security affairs, engagement with uh, foreign leaders and countries uh, around the world, and uh, it is um, important work even when the attention uh, of uh, others is elsewhere, and that, that's why this 
you know, this president uh, has made the security, the safety and security of the United States and its people uh, such a high priority. It's why he has uh, acted uh, sometimes at some risk uh, to fulfill his promises uh, on, uh, in the foreign policy arena, including ending the war in Iraq, increasing our troop presence initially in <coughs> Afghanistan in order to properly execute that war and to take the fight to al-Qaeda, uh, and to uh, create a situation, for example, with Iran where uh, the approach he took led to a level of international consensus about Iran being the problem uh, that did not exist prior to him coming into office. So, uh, I mean, that's simply to say that the foreign policy is a big part of the job. Are you, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you not, I'm sorry, are you not um, answering it because you don't want to discuss it because he's overseas and typically you don't talk about a, a, a U.S. I'm just president. not going to, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what, the, the question as it relates to the president here is, is unclear to me and, I, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to give a performance critique of, uh, um, of the governor, former governor, you know, from the podium. Is the president, well, has, the president, has the president been aware, made aware of some of the gaffes overseas so far? Well, as you know, the president follows the news, but I, uh, I know, uh, I, I don't know how much uh, he's been following this particular story. Thanks, guys.